Now, uh, we are talking about OCD, and, and, and I just want to, to just touch on a couple of things uh, with, with kids. And, and this, this is uh, the, the one area, uh, there's actually two areas of uh, psychopharmacology that, that have been studied for many years in treating pre-adolescent kids. It's ADHD and childhood onset OCD, and there are medications, a number of the anti uh, Depressants are FDA approved for treating OCD in children. Okay, and uh, so you can see here that a third to a half have childhood onset. Uh, it, it tends to occur earlier in boys than girls, uh, but just like we said before, very chronic course. And uh, despite the fact that there are actually good outcomes from cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's hard to find therapists, but also some kids, uh, the exposure part is just too scary. So medications can be, can be used. And just like with, the, uh, with adults, you have a, a slow onset of action, and it's going to be important to uh, really get the dose up as high as possible where it's tolerable so you don't run into too many side effects, and then just stay with it. And, and you get that you'll continue to have uh, improvement uh, you know, over a long period of time, usually plateauing out at about a year. And it says here, uh, by a year, uh, then there's uh, more than 50% improvement. And there's some, I've, I've had a couple of people who basically, it, there are no symptoms. That, that's, that's the exception, not the rule. But for most people, uh, the medications are effective enough that their life really is a lot better. Okay. So, augmentation. Uh, Abuse bar augmentation uh, it says not supported in group studies. Uh, this is one of those kind of augmenting strategies <clears throat> where if you uh, if you look at groups, it doesn't look good at all. But sometimes you'll find an individual kid that it works remarkably well, and because this could be so devastating, and because abuse bar is so benign in terms of really low side effect profile. Uh, it's absolutely worthwhile. What if one out of ten kids, it works really well? Well, that doesn't look good in a group study, right, at the individual trial. So this is, is oftentimes used at least uh, effective in, with some kids. Okay, school avoidance used to be called school phobia, and, and kids are not afraid of the school, you know, so it's really not school phobia. It's, it's separation anxiety, and if there's any number of reasons that this can occur. And if you take a look at uh, John, uh, John March has uh, been the most research on this. He's kind of an old timer, but he's done a lot of work with kids and medication. CBT, 30% of people respond well to that, 70% uh, with combination. But here's the biggest problem, and every teacher will tell you this. You know, uh, get the oldest teacher you know back in the, you know, teaching in the 1940s or 50s or something, and, and they'll tell you uh, that these kids that start getting afraid to go to school. What you got to do is you got to get them back in school tomorrow. The longer they stay out of school, this becomes more entrenched. And, and you can have anxiety, but, but probably even more oftentimes, rather than having just uh, you know, normal anxiety symptoms, you get stomach aches. Uh, you know, stu uh, GI distress uh, is, is a common manifestation of anxiety in children. And so uh, how long does it take to get that 70%? It, it takes weeks, you know, many weeks of CBT and antidepressants, so uh, that may be helpful in the long run, but the best thing to do is give these kids some Ativan and say, uh, you know, we'll start seeing a, a psychotherapist here as soon as we can, but you've got to go back to school tomorrow, no ifs, ands, or buts, okay? And uh, one of the most important things, though, uh, to first to check out is, uh, is this, the role of anxious parents in separation anxiety. Now, I, this may, I, it may sound a little tongue-in-cheek, but not really. You know, some of these kids that uh, are afraid to leave home, uh, it's, they're, it's like their parents are saying to them uh, before they go to school, now, you've got to be really <coughs> careful. Uh, you know, there are bad guys out there, you know, stranger danger, and, you know, you can kidnap, and you'll be raped, and then they'll kill you, and we'll never see you again and it's going to be horrible, and, and have a nice day, you know. And, and so many, and this is just no kidding, so many times, uh, you know, give mom or dad some Xanax, <laughs> uh, because they're overdoing it and scaring their kids. Okay, so that's certainly worth taking a look at. Okay, simple or specific phobias. Uh, 
fear of dental work, uh, just give a tranquilizer, big deal. You know? In fact, nowadays they have, I can't remember what they call it, but they actually put you into an almost unconscious state you know, with sedatives and stuff like that. Uh, nothing wrong with that. The problem with the uh, real severe uh, exam anxiety is a lot of the drugs, as we know, that treat anxiety also put your cortex asleep. And that's not good during the examination. So uh, with kids, uh, I don't know of any studies, uh, you know, with, with uh, beta blockers, but uh, clonidine has been used a lot in treating kids uh, and can provide some anti-anxiety uh, actions uh, that are, you know, relatively, you know, quick onset. You don't have to wait for weeks. Uh, all you have to do is just make sure that you don't overdose the kids or they'll get lightheaded and dizzy and that kind of stuff. So if it's really incapacitating exam, exam anxiety, you can use clonidine, uh, but probably, uh, you know, it, it's going to be helpful for, for that kid to get in therapy as well. But this is the main thing I want to say really about these, these uh, and we're talking about severe crippling phobias. A lot of kids have phobias uh, that is part of normal childhood development, fear of the dark or you know, maybe fear of big dogs or something like that, uh, that they get over. You know, they don't need treatment that grossly interfere with their being able to live. But when you have re very severe specific phobias, that's where you got to really go because a lot of times a phobia is just the tip of the iceberg and there's something else going on. Uh, <clears throat> about 60% of kids that develop bipolar will start developing really severe anxiety uh, uh, one to three years before the more florid bipolar disorder comes up. So it may be one of the uh, you know, early manifestations of what can become bipolar. Now, now, having said that, the majority of kids that have phobias don't have bipolar, okay? But, but that would be an example of uh, it's being, it reflects an, another comorbidity or more basic disorder on the surface. But a lot of times what it turns out to be is some bad stuff's happening in their life, you know, domestic violence or, you know, they're being molested or, or something like that. So, you know, th this knee-jerk reaction to just get people drugs, you know, uh, it's just not okay. you got to really go look and see, see what else is going on. Now, this is a, a very... Uh, interesting study in, in a couple of respects. One is it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which almost is a very elite, prestigious journal, and they almost never publish psychiatric studies because, uh, you know, they're not, they're not good enough for the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, I hope I don't offend anybody who, you know, is on the editorial board or you know, whatever. But anyway, but it got in there, and the reason it got in there is because the, the outcome was just astounding. Now, uh, I actually got to uh, meet and talk with the uh, principal investigator on the study a couple of years ago. So anyway, what they did is they took, uh, these are uh, <coughs> children and teenagers, <coughs> excuse me, and they have severe anxiety disorders, okay? And, and, and one thing that's been noticed for a long time is that oftentimes these go hand in hand. You start earlier in life having separation anxiety, and then you have uh, it kind of evolves into social anxiety, and then as young adults, it more into generalized anxiety disorder. So they're uh, they oftentimes kind of go hand in hand. Uh, this is only an eight-week study, uh, but as I mentioned in our last class, the onset of anti-anxiety uh, results from treatment with SSRIs is a lot faster. Uh, with anxiety than with depression. And, and they used Luvox, uh, but I, I talked to the, again, I talked to the uh, researcher and he said, oh, it doesn't make any difference. That's just the one we chose. It could be any, any of the SSRIs. Okay, same thing. But first off, they used high doses. Okay, so they didn't uh, pussyfoot around, uh, always making sure they can tolerate it. But look at the, at the difference between placebo response and drug response. And this is huge. And this actually has the highest effect size of any treatment in psychiatry, period, the end, okay? And, and this kind of finding has been uh, seen in other studies as well. So th these drugs are uh, very effective in treating a range of anxiety disorders. Uh, I'm not going to talk about panic disorder uh, in, in children, mainly because it, uh, it's, it's extraordinarily rare uh, prior to going through puberty. But you can have isolated panic attacks in kids uh, 
but most of the time it's, it's in response to some kind of very significant psychological stressors. But the classic panic disorder uh, starts emerging uh, after people go through puberty.